morning, Caudill Baptist Church. Good morning. We are so, so happy to see everyone here today. Gosh, I love you guys. Thank you for coming today. Our staff. Amen. Let's just let's just get excited about being together. Amen. Amen. God is doing a new thing in this place. He is doing a new thing. Can you say that with me? God is doing a new thing. Okay, now those three, now everybody. God is doing a new thing, and he is today. He is doing a new thing in this place because of you and because of me being faithful. The Lord wants to manifest his presence in this place. Let's praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Everybody, give me a big shout out. Amen. Amen. All right. Vicki's going to lead us this morning in an opening song. church. Y'all may have a seat. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord today. Um, it's so good to see y'all. I've been talking to y'all through Facebook for so many weeks, um, but it's so good to actually see your face when I'm talking to you. Know that you aren't laying on your bed or your couch or something. You're sitting here um, with us this morning. Um, today is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Um, it always is, and it's it's been a trial over the last 11 weeks, I'm, I think it is now. Um, so, But now, um, we're here and we're reopened, um, and now God, God has been doing something, and He can continue to do something. Um, and so we're going to gather every week, and we're going to just trust um, God in the season um, that we are here. Um, a couple announcements I want to um, give to you is, um, let's see, 
Um, so we're going to continue to stream on Facebook every week. So if you don't feel good, you are sick, there's something, you, you just can't make it, um, make sure you log into Facebook and um, you can um, watch us on Facebook just like every other week. Um, in the mornings at 9 a.m., we're doing a, um, a broadcast on Facebook of our bilingual service. So you're um, able to join in on that service. We encourage you to be here at the 1045 service. Um, that is where we're welcoming people in. Um, the 9 o'clock will just be for the Facebook Live um, service. Um, also, Wednesday nights and every Wednesday we've been doing, on Wednesday nights we have been doing a prayer service in the parking lot. So if you haven't been able to join us or you didn't know about it for some reason, please join us on Wednesday nights. It's been a sweet time of prayer and worship together as we've just been um, trusting God and, and calling on the name of Jesus um, because that's what we need um, during this time. That's what we need. Um, we need Jesus um, now more than ever. Um, and so that's what we've been doing is gathering together and worshiping and praying together. Um, next Sunday is Father's Day, and we will celebrate fathers um, and mothers and have a baby dedication. Uh, also, at the end of this service today, we will have Lord's Supper. So if you didn't grab a um, Lord's Supper cup as you came in, we can have a deacon bring it to you um, if you would just let us know or if you would like to go back and grab one. Um, they're on either side of the, the, the foyer um, entry. So uh, make sure you have one of those because we'll partake as a, as a um, church here in a little bit. Um, also, uh, thank you for giving during this time. Um, we have y'all have been faithful to give. Um, God has blessed us with people that love to give and love um, have a love for Him, and so He is. Um, we're so grateful, but I know it blesses His heart um, that you give. Um, also, I forgot to announce. Um, many of y'all have already grabbed one of these. They're in the foyer, so if you haven't, make sure you grab one. We encourage you just to grab one, so we have enough for everyone. Um, they are, I'm guessing they're washable. You can throw it in the washer, wash it every week, um, and wear it on Sundays or wear it while you're out so people can see it. Um, it's just a way that um, uh, we want to um, keep y'all safe. We're taking every precaution that we can um, here at Connell um, to make sure you're safe, your family's safe, um, and you can come in and worship without being in fear of, um, of something. So um, also, today's a special day because it's Graduate Sunday. Um, this is a weird graduation for our graduates. Um, I, forever, I think in all of history, there's nothing been like this. And so um, class of 2020, y'all are like, y'all are, it's, it's a trial type of thing. Hopefully we don't have to do it ever again. They, they don't have to do it ever again. But um, this year, we know y'all have been through a lot. Um, and so we want to recognize y'all. So I'm going to ask all the graduates to come down. And if y'all would just kind of spread out on the front um, and facing the, the congregation. So all your class of 2020 graduates. I'll come down there and be near y'all. Yeah, give them a round of applause. So I want to, um, I'm going to face the, the church for a second. Um, these graduates, many of them have been here for many, many, many years since y'all were little babies to when y'all are now. Um, and some have been here over the last couple of years and you've known them and you've loved them. Um, and this is a bittersweet time every year. I love Graduate Sunday because I get to look at them in their face. I get to see them and their accomplishments and we get to celebrate them. But um, also it's a time that they're taking that next step. Um, and I heard it this way, is that it's like a, we're a launching pad. We don't keep something, we don't build something to keep it in, and we don't put it in storage. We build it so that we can send it out. Um, and so that's what, that's what we're doing, is that we didn't build you all, but we have equipped it. We, I pray that we have equipped you, um, and the church has equipped you um, over the years, that now you can launch out from this place. And wherever you all go, um, then God will use you um, wherever you land. Um, so I'm going to go down just the line, and I'm going to introduce the class of 2020 to you. Uh, this is Brandon Nahulua. Many of y'all have known him for many, many years. Um, but uh, Brandon graduated from Southwest High School, um, and he is going to Full Sail University in Florida, correct? Okay. Um, and he, uh, Brandon has been a part of our ministry for um, years, and I've enjoyed him being in the youth ministry um, just week in and week out. He's there, and so I'm so thankful for that. 
this is Pavel Razo. Um, he graduated from Arlington Heights High School, um, and he is just, he's going to follow God in this next season as he is um, going, going from this place. Um, and Pavel has been there, I, I, I remember him when he was in the nursery and when he was in the children's ministry, um, and so I got to um, be, just kind of see him grow up also. I, I remember with Brandon, I remember that I, um, I was a children's uh, sponsor for Lisa at Children's Camp, and Brandon was one of our kids that was there, and so it's just been cool to be a part of that and then see where he has come um, from this um, point. Um, this is Jessica Johnson. Uh, she is uh, she graduated from uh, Brewer High School, um, and she is going to Texas A and M in the fall. Oh no, that's mm, no no. Um, we still love you, but I don't know. Um, Jessica has been a big part of our youth ministry. Um, her her joy that she brings in, her laughter that she brings in, her um, just her spirit that she brings into our youth ministry. She is changed um, the atmosphere of our youth ministry. She's been a true leader um, in our ministry, and so I'm, I'm thankful for you, Jessica, in, in that ministry. And I'm thankful that I've seen you uh, as you were a part of the children's ministry with, with them, and um, I, have, um, I was at camp with y'all, and so I've seen her grow um, into the young lady that she is today. This is Heidi Hall. Uh, Heidi has been here for many years. I actually had the privilege of baptizing her, what, like four years ago, maybe, something like that? think. Um, Heidi graduated from Alito High School. Um, in, in the Actually, in a month or so, you're leaving for boot camp, correct? For the Marines. Um, so she's going to serve um, in that way. Um, I've seen Heidi grow up over the last several years. She's been a part of our ministry. Um, she's gone to camp and she's done stuff with us. And I'm, I'm thankful for you just being there and, and constantly um, being a part of our ministry. And this is Andrea Vega. Um, some of y'all may not recognize her, but she has been a part of us for a couple years now. She has um, been um, on mission trips with us, and I've got to know you, and um, just her uh, wittiness to come back and say something to me. I'm like, what? I, I didn't know you were talking, but she, she will come back and say something. I'm like, oh, I didn't know. But um, Andrea um, graduated from Brewer High School also, um, and she will be going to Tarrant County College in the fall. Um, so she'll be nearby, um, and we're just thankful for all of these graduates. So let's give them a round of applause again. Let me move. And I want to um, read this scripture over you. Um, I preached it a couple years ago on Graduate Sunday, um, and I think it's just it's a it's a perfect verse for this time. So in Psalm 37, 3, it says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will do it. Um, let me talk to you all for a second. Um, Y'all, um, I've seen y'all grow up, and I've, seen, I've known y'all for a couple years maybe, but, or I've seen y'all over the years. Um, let me tell you this one thing, is that trust God in everything you do. Follow after him, no matter where you go, what you do, trust him. Follow him, and he's going to lead you where he wants you to go. He loves you. We love you. Um, it, it, it's, it's a crazy season. It's, it's full of joy and full of sadness, kind of. Um, but we... Um, uh, we celebrate y'all. We, we're going to lift y'all up. Um, know that you have a church behind you praying for you, um, loving you. No matter where you go, no matter what church you go to, no matter um, what state you're in, you always have home here. This is your home base. This is where you launch from, and you will always be welcome here. Um, and so know that you are loved so much, um, and that God is going to go with you, and he's going to lead you. Um, I can't wait in a couple years to see where y'all are. I don't want to lose contact with y'all ever, um, but I can't wait to see where God leads you in the, in the future. Um, in the church, I want, I want to challenge y'all. I want to challenge you that um, these graduates are going to take this next step in um, their journey, wherever that is. Some are going to be a couple hours away. Some are going to another state. Some are going um, just to different parts. Some are going to still be here in our town. Let's pray for these graduates daily. They're going to take steps that they have never taken before. And this is a weird season for them. They don't, it's not like every other graduates. It's not like a 2019 graduates, not like 2011 when I graduated. It's different. And so let's, um, let's pray for them daily. Let's pray for them always. When they come to your mind, pray for them. Pray for the class of 2020. These graduates represent numerous, thousands and thousands of graduates um, that are um, 
kind of taking that next step. So let's pray for this generation as they go in. Um, and so I'm going to ask Leanna Wester to come up. These are, or actually, give a round of applause for your high school 2020 graduates. I should have had you come up before I read the scripture, and I'm sorry. Um, this is Leanna Wester. She is coming up right now. Um, Leanna graduated this year um, from Laterno University um, with a um, degree in ele uh, elementary education. And she has a job in the fall at Diamond Hill Elementary School. So she's still around. She ain't, she's not going anywhere, but she has a job lined up. And it's um, God has provided in that way, and we've seen that. We've been praying as a church and as a leadership. She's a part of our leadership team, and um, we're so thankful for her and um, just her guidance um, in, that, in this season. Um, and so now she can, um, God has provided for her for this next season. So I'm going to ask that y'all just extend your hand towards them, and I'm going, we're just going to pray over them, and we're going to um, lift them up and have, um, uh, just let, just, just dedicate them to the Lord. So let's pray over them. Father God, we thank you for these graduates. God, I thank you for their lives. I thank you um, for what they mean to me, but what they mean to this church. But more than that, they're, they're your children, and we're, we're so thankful for them. God, I thank you for the relationships they built here, uh, many from when they were little, little bitty in this church to now they're graduating, they're leaving this place. Um, God, we pray for them. We ask that you guide them over these next steps. God, I pray that you um, would continue to provide for these high school graduates and Leanna. God, would you continue to guide her and lead her um, in where she, wherever you call her. Let, let Leanna be the teacher that she um, is called to be. Let her be your light where she, in, in her school. God, and also these graduates, when they go to college or they go to the, the workforce, or wherever they go, God, would you allow them to be the light um, that you've called them to be? Jesus, we love these graduates, these boys and girls. God, we, we love them. We're so thankful for them. We're thankful that you're going to send them places that we don't even imagine. But God, you know, you are in control of them. And so, God, we trust you with them. God, we ask that you just go with them. Um, God, be with us during the service. We love you. Um, come into the midst of this place. We ask things in your holy, precious name. Amen. Graduates, y'all have a card right here. Each one of y'all grab a card. Leanna, your basket's right here. So if y'all want to grab and go see your families. Amen. Let's just give them one more. Hey, we're so proud of you. You know it. And we are, we are proud of y'all. Amen. What an accomplishment. Let's just stand together. And as we stand up, let's just breathe in the presence of the Lord. He is in this place. Sometimes I tell my worship team, look, there's Jesus right there on the front row. And he's watching you to hear his children sing. You may be watching us online or you may have come into this place today and there may be something in your heart. You may be worried about a job. You maybe have gotten some bad health news. You may have a loved one that's sick. But God is in control and you are above it all, Lord. You are above it and you are worthy. Lord, we ascribe worthiness to you.
Don't you love Jesus? Don't you love Jesus today? Don't you love Jesus? Aren't you glad that he paid it all? All of it. It's been paid. We're not battling from a place of defeat. We already had the victory. Jesus has the victory. He paid it all. Paid in full. Let's worship and sing this song. Tell Jesus how much we love him. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. Thank you, Father, that you grew the tree that you knew would be used to nail your only son to the cross just for us, Lord. And we thank you, and we give you praise. And as our pastor comes today, Lord, let us just receive with gladness the love that he is sharing himself through Jesus Christ today. Just receive it today. In Jesus' name, and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I cannot tell you how happy I am today to see every one of your beautiful faces here this morning. Frankly, we didn't know how many folks would, you know, come out and... Uh, into the sun and, and go to church again. We thought maybe 25 out of our regular 100 might come, but I think just about everybody came today. Praise the Lord. It's so good to see you. I've missed you so much. Go ahead, go ahead. I've missed you. Before the service, I was out speaking to everybody that I could and just soaking in your beautiful friendship and your presence and it is wonderful, just wonderful to be here. I've been preaching for the last 
11 or 12 weeks to four people and a whole bunch of empty chairs. And the Spirit of the Lord has been there. There's no doubt about that. And I've been very aware that you're there on the other side of the computer screen. And I know you have been. But there's nothing like real, live, flesh and blood people in the Lord's house worshiping Him together. And uh, I just praise the Lord today. I hope I can get through this without crying. I'm just so happy to see you. I thought that the greatest thing that we could do today on our first Sunday back after this long COVID-19 shutdown would be to take communion together. Actually, we do it on the fifth Sunday. That would have been last Sunday. But I just said, you know, let's hold on for one more Sunday until everyone is back together. And as a a sort of symbol of our unity and our togetherness as the church of Jesus to uh, join in that beautiful uh, symbol of the Lord's Supper. So we're going to spend some time at the cross today in preparation for that. I don't want to rush the Lord's Supper, and I don't want it to be a tack-on to the rest of the service. I want all of this to be about the Lord Jesus and his death on the cross for us this morning, and we're going to climax that by taking the Lord's Supper. Let me say that if you did not receive your elements when you first came in, be sure and get those because we'll do that at the end of the service. And I know it's a little bit different in this whole COVID-19 non-contact world. We're having to do Lord's Supper a little bit different, but the heart of it remains. But do make sure you have those. I want you to turn in your Bible this morning to Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 through 54. And I want to say that the cross of Jesus Christ is extraordinary. There's so many things that we could say about the cross of Jesus. But today I want to focus in on the fact that there's nothing in all history, past, present, or future, like the cross of Jesus. It's extraordinary. And I use that word on purpose because it means beyond the ordinary, out of the ordinary, super ordinary. And not in the sense that crucifixion itself is extraordinary. Sadly, in history, thousands, if not tens or hundreds of thousands of people were crucified by Rome. It's not that crucifixion uh, was... uh, extraordinary. But the crucifixion of Jesus was one of a kind among all of the crucifixions that happened uh, in Jerusalem and in Israel under the Romans. At the crucifixion of Jesus, some things occurred. In fact, five specific things occurred at the crucifixion of Jesus that had never occurred before and will never occur again that say, This crucifixion of this man in this place at this time stands alone from all of the others. And the crucifixion is God speaking, and through these extraordinary events that happen at the crucifixion, God is saying, pay attention. I'm only going to say this once. And so we see five extraordinary, one-of-a-kind once only events that took place. And I want us to walk through those this morning. Starting in verse 45, we see an extraordinary darkness. It says, Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. Now in ancient times, they started counting hours at 6 a.m. Jews did particularly 6 a.m. so that 7 a.m. would be the first hour and so forth. So when it says the sixth hour, count from 6 a.m., that would be 12 noon. So from 12 noon to the ninth hour, three hours later, then that would be 3 o'clock. From noon to 3 o'clock. And so Jesus at this point in verse 45 has been on the cross for three hours. Three hours in the light. Darkness comes at noon, and so from nine until noon, it's been three hours of light. And in those three hours of light, Jesus spoke. He had three things to say during those hours of light. The first is recorded in Luke 23, verse 34, where Jesus, the first thing he said was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It was common for men who were being crucified to spit, to curse, to call for revenge against their executioners, 
but not Jesus. Jesus alone, of all people who had ever been crucified, did something no one else had ever done or ever would do again. Jesus prayed for his killers, and he prayed for their forgiveness. Jesus wasn't crucified alone, as we know. There were two men crucified with Jesus, two robbers, one on either side. But one of those robbers, though at first both had been mocking and making fun of Jesus, one of those robbers, upon hearing this word of this man in the middle of forgiveness, wanted to get a good look at this guy. And so he craned his neck around the best that he could to see this man who had just asked for the forgiveness of his executioners. And he saw something that he hadn't noticed before, the sign above this man's head. That was unique. No one else usually had a sign, but this man had a sign. It gave the reasons why Jesus was being crucified in three languages. The reason was king of the Jews. It was the joke of the day. How could this dying man be a king? But this man, this robber, upon hearing Jesus say what he had just said, realized that Jesus was a king. He was not only a king, he was the king, the divine king. And every king has a kingdom. And so he believed in Jesus. He believed that somehow... In spite of the cross, this wasn't going to be be the end of this man in the middle. This man was going to live on beyond that. And that just one thought from this man in his kingdom, this king in his kingdom, would secure this thief for time and eternity. And so he did something that was unthinkable. The dying thief honors the dying king by praying to him. And he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And in response to that, for the second time from the cross, Jesus speaks to the believing sinner. He says, verse 43, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. He only asked to be remembered, but Jesus gave him eternal life in response for his faith. He only asked to be in a kingdom and slightly remembered by the king But Jesus said, no, you'll be in paradise with me forever. Such is the promise of Jesus to all who put their faith in him. And then in John John 19, verse 26, it says that Jesus saw his mother there, Mary, and his disciple whom he loved, which we all know was John, who, by the way, was also Jesus' first cousin. And though Jesus' nerve endings are screaming with pain, And he's dying the most horrid death that you can imagine. And people usually became very introspective and inwardly turned. Jesus, rather than being absorbed in his own pain, is concerned for the care of his mother. Now Joseph was dead at this point, and so Jesus, as the oldest son, was responsible for his mom's care. But he's not going to be able to care for her, obviously, beyond this. And so Jesus spoke a third time. He speaks first to his mother. And he says, woman. Now today, if we were to call a lady woman, that would be sort of disrespectful, wouldn't it? That, that seems harsh. But in Jesus' day, it was a term of uh, endearment. Back in John chapter 2, when Jesus turned the water to wine at the wedding in Cana, you remember that even early on back then, he called his mother woman. It was a sort of a pet name for his mom, we would assume. I called my mom Mama, but Jesus called his mother Woman. And so he uses that same name that he apparently has used his whole life, and he says, Woman, behold your son. Not me. He's not talking about himself. He's not saying, Hey, Mom, look at me. Look how horrible I look. Look at this horrible way that I'm dying. Look what they've done to me, Mom. How cruel that would have been for Jesus to point that out to his grieving mother in front of his cross. Jesus isn't talking about himself. If, he, if we could have been there, we might have seen Jesus nod with his head toward John, who was right beside Mary, his aunt, by the way, the only of the disciples who was there at the cross. And he says, woman, behold your son. In other words, John, 
will take my place just as I'm taking John's place and dying for his sin. He will take my place in responsibility and he will take care of you. You say, why not his, his, his brothers? Why not the second oldest brother? Because they weren't believers yet. They would be. But at that point, they're not believers. He wants to trust his mother over to someone who not only will care for her, but who believes, who's a believer, because his mother certainly is. And so he says, Mom, he's your son now, and he'll take care of you. Let him do that. And then he says to John, Behold your mother. John, as I'm dying here, and I won't be able to take care of that precious lady, would you take care of my mom for me? In each of these statements of Jesus from the cross, forgive them. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Take care of my mom. They're full of light, aren't they? Jesus came into the world as the light of the world. And we see the light during those first three hours, not only in the sky, but there's no darkness in the sky. There's no darkness in Jesus. Three hours of goodness, three hours of mercy, three hours of love. But at the sixth hour, as the sun reaches its zenith in the sky at noon, that changes. The sky inexplicably goes dark so that it's midnight at midday. And for those three hours of darkness, Jesus speaks not a word. Jesus is completely silent. What was this darkness that fell on the land for three hours? Most people believe that it's an eclipse. I was talking with someone the other day about this, and they said, yeah, that was an eclipse. But here's the thing about a solar eclipse, a couple of things. First, solar eclipses last about two minutes. This darkness lasted three hours. There's no no such thing as a three-hour solar eclipse. Second, solar eclipses happen at a new moon. But Jesus was crucified at Passover, which is always at a full moon not a new moon. So this in no way could have been a solar eclipse. This was an extraordinary darkness. This was a supernatural kind of darkness. In Luke's gospel, chapter 23, verse 45, Luke says it this way, the sun was darkened, passive tense. The the darkening was done to the sun by an outward force. And he uses the word eclipo, from which we get our word eclipse, but it literally means failed. The sun was failed. How was the sun failed? God failed the sun in the sky for three hours. Could God do that? Could the God who made the sun fail the sun? Well, absolutely. In Joshua chapter 10, he made the sun stand still. In 1 Kings 20, he moved the sun backwards. In Exodus 10, he caused a thick darkness to fall on Egypt for three days. In the end times, the Bible says that God will blot out the sun. Of course God can do that. But why? Why did God hide the sun for those three hours? Was it to hide the scorn of men? Was it to hide Christ's shame? Was it to hide his nakedness? Was it to cover the horror of Christ's death? Was it God protesting the cross with darkness? What does the darkness mean? Well, in the Bible, darkness always means judgment. God's salvation is always depicted as light, but God's judgment is always depicted as darkness. And so God turns off the sun, so to speak, to show that these three hours is a time of judgment. Judgment on what? On the only thing that God ever judges sin. Darkness falls as God judges sin. And so, counter to what some people sometimes say, the cross isn't a good man sacrificing himself for a noble cause, but the cross is the judgment of God on human sin in the person of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3, the Bible says, Christ died for our sins. Jesus is being crucified for our sins. 
And this supernatural darkness is the visible manifestation from God showing that a -a one-of-a-kind, extraordinary judgment is taking place on Jesus at the cross. And because of that, in verse 46, we see an extraordinary forsakenness. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in just a few moments from saying those words, Jesus gives up his spirit and dies. It's now the ninth hour. It's now 3 p.m. The darkness is from noon until 3, and so now the darkness has ended. The judgment of God is over. And Jesus emerges from the darkness, and his first word is a cry of forsakenness. After three hours of absolute silence in the darkness of God's judgment, Jesus now sends up a loud cry. It says he cried out with a loud voice. The Greek word is anaboao, which means to shout or cry upwards. He's not shouting at the crowd. He's shouting at God. He's crying. He's praying upwardly to God. He's crying out to God. For six long hours, Jesus has been in physical agony that none of us can imagine. Muscles cramping, nerve endings on fire, the rough wood of that cross rubbing his bloody back as he stretches up to gasp in air and then collapses again over and over. But worse than the physical pain is the spiritual pain of God's furious judgment on sin as Jesus becomes sin on our behalf during those three hours. And that's why he didn't speak. Jesus was bearing your sin and my sin and suffering the wrath and the condemnation of God in our place. He was separated from God by our sin. For the first time in eternity, the Son was separated from the Father and the Spirit. And there was nothing to say. No one would answer if he had. A holy God had turned away from his own son as he became sin for you and me. And now, at the end of that, as that has come to its completion, Jesus now voices the agony of those three hours of separation in this cry. It's a quote from Psalm 22, verse 1, a prophecy that the Messiah would say these very words. And he did. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Such a cry has never gone up from a child of God and been true. When the Israelites were in Egypt and God darkened the land, God didn't leave his children in the dark. But on the cross, the greatest darkness that has ever fallen fell on the Lord Jesus Christ and God abandoned his own son in the darkness. No one wants to be alone in the dark. There are terrors in the dark. But Jesus is alone, abandoned by God in the dark. And now that's over. And Jesus screams out, My God, my God, you're mine, you're my God. Why have you forsaken me? Where did you go? You didn't just leave me, you forsook me. You abandoned me. You turned your back on me. Why? It breaks your heart, doesn't it? To think of the very Son of God, the lovely Jesus, abandoned by the loving God. How could God be abandoned by God? Martin Luther said, it doesn't make sense. We can't even grasp it. Our minds can't wrap around it. How could it happen? Such a pitiful cry has never been uttered before and been true. Well, why? Jesus said, why? Why? Why did God do that? Why did God forsake his own son? Listen to me. He did it for you. And he did it for me. God forsook his own son when Jesus became sin in your place so that he would never have to forsake you. And we can sing, I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. 
Jesus became sin and suffered being forsaken by God so that you and I could become children of God that nothing could separate us from his love. Can somebody say amen? Amazing love. How can it be that you, my Lord, would die for me? And yet when Jesus speaks this soul-wrenching cry of forsakenness, the sinful crowd at the foot of the cross mocks him. Verse 47, And some of those who were standing there when they heard it began to say, This man is calling for Elijah. Now Jesus spoke those words in Aramaic. In fact, we have them in the Aramaic in our Bible. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And Jesus spoke Aramaic. And they all spoke Aramaic. They all knew the difference between Eli and Eliyah, which is the Hebrew pronunciation of Elijah. Eli, El means God, E ending means my, Eli, my God. Eliyah, my God, is the Lord. Eliyah, El, God, E, my, Yah, short for Yahweh, Lord. Just as clearly as you know the difference between my God and my God is the Lord, they knew very well the difference between Eli and Eliyah. This is what we today call fake news. What they're saying wasn't true and they knew it, but they said it anyway to mock Jesus. You see, in Malachi chapter 4, Elijah will come before the Messiah. And they all knew that. So what they're doing is they're mocking Jesus and saying, Hey, he's calling for Elijah. He's calling for Elijah to come and proclaim him as the Messiah and deliver him and set up his kingdom. Yeah, right. Ha, ha, ha. Ironically, Jesus just paid for that very sin of their cruel mockery. And so he overlooks their mockery. He doesn't respond to it. He goes on as though it didn't happen. And he speaks again. John 19, verse 28. He says, I thirst. I thirst. Just two words. But it's so powerful. It's a cry of need and a cry of victory. First, it's a cry of need, obvious need. After three hours in the sun from nine until noon, and then another three hours from noon till three in the white-hot fierceness of God's judgment on sin in the person of Jesus, Jesus is exhausted. Jesus is depleted. Jesus is physically thirsty. He's dehydrated. He needs water just like anyone would because he's not only God, he's man. But more than physical thirst... He thirsts spiritually. He thirsts for fellowship with God again. Having been forsaken by his Father as he paid for our sin, Jesus is now ready to be returned to communion with God. And he thirsts for restoration with the Father. But there's another sense in which this is a cry of victory. Just like any champion who's struggled and suffered and after winning, pants out the news that is already obvious to everyone, I'm thirsty. Jesus has suffered in the ultimate struggle with sin, and he has won. And now as the champion of champions, as the champion of salvation, Jesus cries victoriously, I am thirsty. Back to Matthew 27, verse 49 says, Immediately one of them, one of who? One of those men that was mocking Jesus. One of them ran, taking a sponge. He filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed. Reeds were things that they used to measure things. They were like their measuring yardsticks. It was about 18 inches long, which tells us that the cross wasn't really very high off the ground. In most movies, you see Jesus up on a cross that's like, you know, way up in the air. But it was really just a little bit off the ground. You could reach it with an 18-foot reed, his mouth. And it says he gave him a drink. One merciful soul. But in verse 49, the rest keep up their mockery. But the rest of them said, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him, doubling down on the fake news. Of course, they don't think he's going to be saved. Every time that they talk about Jesus being saved, it's obvious that he can't be saved. It's part of that mockery. And Jesus died with their mockery still in his ears. 
which is the third first, an extraordinary death. Verse 50, Jesus cried again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. That's not the whole story. You have to go to Luke and John to get the rest of what happened in those few minutes. John 19 verse 30 tells us that before he yielded up his spirit, he said, it is finished. And Luke 23 verse 46 adds that he then said, Father, not my God anymore. God is not just a God, but he's Father. Communion has now been restored. He calls God his Father. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. The key words there are, it is finished. It is finished. It's a cry of completion. And we have to ask, what was finished? Well, not Jesus. Jesus isn't saying, I am finished. He says, it is finished. Atonement is finished. The purpose for which Jesus went to the cross in the first place is done. It's one word in the Greek, the word tetelestai. It was a farmer's word. When a new little lamb would be born with no defects, no blemishes, the farmer would say tetelestai. It is perfect. It was also an artist's word. When an artist put on the finishing touches, he'd stand back and say tetelestai. Nothing more needs to be done. It was also a priest's word. When a perfect animal would be brought for sacrifice, the priest would say, Tetelestai, it is a perfect sacrifice. It was also a merchant's word. When a debt was paid off, across the top of the bill would be written the word, Tetelestai, paid in full. Nothing more is owed. And that's exactly what we have in this word from Jesus at the cross. Atonement is fully accomplished. And Jesus cries, Tetelestai, perfect, nothing more needs to be done. A perfect sacrifice, paid in full, it is finished. And my dear friend, there is nothing more that needs to be done for you to be forgiven and made right with God. No one can add anything to what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. You just repent of your sin and relinquish control of your life and by faith receive Jesus and his finished work for you. But notice something else here. It's not only a cry of completion, but it's also a cry of confirmation. There's a confirmation here of who Jesus was and is. Jesus does something that no one has ever done or will do or could do. He yields up his spirit. He gives up his life force, so to speak. Notice it says, he cried out with a loud voice. I don't know if you've been around anyone who's died, but people who are close to death don't have loud voices. They don't have lung strength to shout with a loud voice. Jesus is not near death. It's only been six hours. People often hung on crosses for days before they died. Jesus is still strong. He can still shout with a loud voice. He's not at the verge of death. But there's no more reason to stay on the cross. What he came to the cross to do is finished. He just said it. It is finished. And so Jesus yields up his spirit. He gives up his spirit. John uses the word afiemi, which means to send away. Jesus sends away. Jesus dismisses his spirit the way that you would dismiss a servant. I'm done with you now. You can leave. Who can do that? No one can do that. No one's ever been able to just will their life force away, will their spirit away. But Jesus does because he's God. Only God has the power of life and death. And here is God in the person of Jesus Christ laying down his life for you and me. In John 10 verse 18, Jesus said, No man takes my life from me, but I lay it down willingly. Jesus didn't lose his life, my friends. He gave his life. Jesus was not a victim of the cross. Jesus was in control, and he gave his life because he's God. 
And then very quickly, two other things happen after that. There's something next, an extraordinary opening, I'm calling it. Verse 51, And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. Immediately upon the death of Jesus Christ, God himself makes an extraordinary announcement, as it were, declaring that the way to God is now open. Here's what he does. It's unmistakable. You can't miss this. This huge, thick veil or curtain separated the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, which symbolized the throne of God, the presence of God. And no one could go in there through that veil except once a year, only the high priest, once a year on the Day of Atonement only after making sacrifices for his own sins, and then only long enough to bring the sacrifice for the people's sins. Anything longer than that, and even the high priest would die. And so that veil symbolized the fact for centuries that sinful man can in no way come near a holy God. But now... The final, ultimate sacrifice for sin has been offered in the person of God's own Son, who is both the sacrifice and the high priest who offers the sacrifice. And it is finished. And the way to God is open. After our state was opened back up again and Retail businesses and restaurants were able to open once again. You see flashing signs in the window that says, Open! We're open! Please come in! You can come in, right? That's exactly what this torn veil says. It's God's flashing neon sign to the world that says, Open! You can come in! Please come in! The way to God has been made available. And I love this. Who opened that way? Not us. Not by all the religion and good works and sacrificing in the world could we open the way to God. Only God could open it, and he did. The instant that Jesus died and the atonement of the cross went into effect, in that instant God himself tore that veil in two from the top to the bottom. God rendered religion inoperative as the way to come near to him. And the only way now to come near to God is through the veil of Jesus Christ, who is the way and the truth and the life, the way by which man comes to God. Quickly, one more first in verses 52 and 53, an extraordinary resuscitation. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. We saw in verse 51 there was an earthquake and rocks were split, but that's not what's extraordinary, not the earthquake. It's that Old Testament believers were raised from the dead. By the way, when were they raised? Not at the death of Jesus. If you read it carefully, they were raised after the resurrection of Jesus. Not on Friday when Jesus died, but sometime after Sunday when Jesus rose from the dead. After that, these Old Testament believers called saints, holy ones, were raised to dead and came out of their tombs. Which So what we have here is, is uh, Matthew fast-forwarding us past the cross, past the empty tomb, past the resurrection, and he says, after Jesus rose from the dead, many saints were raised and came out of their tombs and entered the holy city, which of course is Jerusalem, and appeared to many. That's never happened before. (laughs) And that'll never happen again. The next time the dead are raised, it'll be resurrection day at the end of time. This was something unique. Believers who had died who believed in and were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah as their hope of salvation, their bodies were in their tombs. This earthquake comes and opens up the tombs. And sometime after Christ's resurrection, maybe Joel and Nahum and Ezra and Nehemiah and Habakkuk come walking into town. And you have to know everyone freaked out. And they knew that something has happened that cannot be denied. 
what's the message here? The message here is what Jesus said in John 14, 19. Because I live, you will live also. To those who thought that they had killed Jesus, God is saying, not only did you not kill Jesus, but you can't kill those who believe in Jesus. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in him will live even if he dies, and whoever lives and believes in him will never die. That happened. We got a little foreshadowing of it after the resurrection of Jesus. And it'll happen again for you one day if you believe in Christ. Because Jesus defeated sin when he died on the cross, and he defeated death when he walked out of the grave. And so believers can say with the words of 1 Corinthians 15, 55, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, grave, where is your sting? Well, all these extraordinary things that happened on the cross can only lead to one conclusion. Verse 54. Now the centurion and those who were with him, keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Do you believe that? I believe that. If you are willing to believe that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, and if you will confess that with your mouth, the Bible says that you will be saved. What I've been talking about this morning is the heart of the Christian faith, the heart of our hope of forgiveness and eternal life. And it's available to anyone, to you. You can be saved this morning if you will believe that with your heart and confess that with your mouth. And so I'd like for us all to bow our heads and close our eyes right now. And if you'd like to receive Jesus as your own personal Savior and Lord, the Bible says, you know what? Call on Him. Ask Him. Confess it. And you'll be saved. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. You've got to mean it. It's got to be real. But if you'll pray this, you could be saved right now. And the cross will be for you. Dear God, I am a sinner. I am separated from you by my sin. And I can't change it. But I believe that Jesus is God. I believe that He died on the cross just like the preacher said today. And he died for me. He died for my sin. He rose from the dead. I believe it. I believe he's alive. I believe that he's God. I believe that he lives. And he can be my Lord and my Savior. And so, Jesus, I turn from sin and self. I relinquish control of my own life. And I humbly come to you. I bow before you and I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me and make me new. Come live inside of me and make me your holy temple. Live through me. I am yours and you are mine forever. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And I just have to stop right there and I want to do something that I haven't been able to do for 11 weeks. I want to give a real live, in-person, face-to-face, walk-the-aisle invitation. I've been talking to people about giving their heart to Jesus and asking them to respond on Facebook Messenger, which you can do and we'd love for you to do. But if you're here with us this morning and you just prayed to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to rejoice with you about that, okay? So we're going to stand and sing a song, and I'm going to wait for you right here. Brother Pablo is going to be right over here to my side. If Spanish is your main language, Pablo Razo will be right over here. And I want us to stand together and sing. And you just come and say, I have asked Jesus to come into my heart and I'm going to follow him. Maybe you're already a Christian and you'd like on this first Sunday back to come recommit your life to the Lord and rededicate yourself to Christian service. I think it's a great Sunday to do that. Maybe you want to come and kneel at the altar as a symbol of your rededication. Maybe you want to pray with the pastor about that. We'd love to do that. Whatever God wants you to do, this is your time to do that. You come as we sing. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me.
of anything more appropriate for what we've just experienced and are experiencing than that. Jesus paid it all. Father, we love you. We praise you. We adore you. We can never in a million lifetimes thank you enough for being willing to come into our world and to show us God and then die that horrible death on the cross, to rise from the dead, to be our great high priest who intercedes for us constantly and draws us near to God. Oh, we're so thankful, Jesus. Help us to be faithful and help us to live worthy of that. Help us to shine the light of that message, that truth, that hope to a world. Lord, we've been watching the news for the last 11 days. We know that our world desperately needs hope. Our world needs peace. Our world needs salvation. And it only comes from you, Lord. Help us to be ministers of your peace in a world that is not at peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be seated, please. One of the ways that the Lord Jesus gave us to remember his cross is the Lord's Supper. And we're going to take that right now. I want us to be thoughtful and slow, pause and meditate on what we've just heard this morning about what Jesus did to die on that cross for us. The bread that we'll take represents, it symbolizes the body of Jesus. It should call to our mind Jesus himself hanging on that cross, dying for us. I always try to envision Jesus on the cross in front of me when I take the bread. And then, of course, the juice represents the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus, of course, speaks to his death. It's not the hemoglobin of Jesus that, that saves us, but it's the death of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus that saves us. And so the, the, the grape juice should remind you of the fact that Jesus died. He died in a bloody way. It's not pretty. There's nothing... There's nothing beautiful about the cross of Jesus except what it accomplishes and the love that caused it. But the act of Jesus dying on the cross was a terrible sacrifice, a gory sacrifice. But that's what it took. That's the ugliness of our sin. It required a horrible sacrifice so that we might be forgiven. It should cause us to not want to live in sin. Amen? It should cause us to want to live holy lives. So we remember that. I'm going to ask you, to take the top part off. This is a little hard. I'm even struggling with it. Take that top cellophane part off. There it is. And pull off the cracker out of there. The more we do this, the more we'll get used to it, I hope. And Jesus said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And tear back the rest. Jesus said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until. He comes, and now we leave this place to go do that exact thing, proclaim the death and soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But before we do, I'm going to ask Pablo Razo. Pablo, would you come up here, my brother? So because of COVID and the whole non-contact world that we're living in right now, we're no longer going to be able to pass an offering plate and have that offering time in the worship service, so that's going to take some getting used to. We will 
as of next Sunday, have uh, some beautiful collection boxes, wooden collection boxes, in the foyer and in the hallway that Cecil Lassiter has been building for us. Uh, we were hoping that those would be ready by this Sunday, but they're almost there. He's almost got them done. He said he's been working on them through uh, the summertime. He said he's renamed his garage the Sweat Box. <laughs> And every time that I go to one of those collection boxes, I'm going to think about Cecil sweating to build that for us. And we appreciate you, Cecil, so much for doing that for our church. He saved us a lot of money, you guys, by doing that. And it's going to be very personal for us. So you can give uh, today. There's offering plates at the doors as you leave. And you can place your gifts there. Next Sunday, you can do that in the offering box as you come in or as you leave or really any time that you're in the building. You can also give online. I, I love that so many people have done that. I think somewhere around 20 people, both members of our church and people around the world have been doing that. So cool. We've been able to stream our services over the Internet, and over 1,000 people a week have been joining us in each of our worship services both in the bilingual service and in the English service. We usually have about 100 people come to, into this building on a Sunday. We've been doing like 2,400 people every week. Go ahead and give the Lord an applause for that. Isn't that awesome? <clears throat> so we've made available a way of giving where you can use your computer. We're also working on a, a text giving uh, where you'll be able to text your offering to the church. What a marvelous world we live in today that you can do that so if you want to just put it in the offering box you can do that if you want to go online if you want to go on your phone cool marvelous wonderful so this is what we said we still want to pray for the offering amen even though we can't have an offering time in passing the plate we still want to pray that God will bless our offering and call attention to it so we're going to close every worship service with just an appeal to give some instructions about giving for those who don't know how to use online giving and, you know, those kinds of things. And, uh, and then the deacon that would have prayed as we pass the plate will close our service in prayer, praying for the offering. So, Pablo, you have the distinction of being the first deacon to pray the offertory prayer at the end of the service in our post-COVID Connell way of doing things, all right? So let's stand together and have a closing word of prayer as Pablo prays for our offering and for our church and dismisses us. We pray. Thanks, is dar. Uh, gracias, Padre Celestial, por este momento, por este uh, día que nos diste, Señor. Tú lo hiciste y hiciste posible que ya nos reuniéramos aquí, Señor. Gracias por tu maravilloso amor y gracias por todas las bendiciones que nos has dado durante este tiempo, por todas las enseñanzas que nos diste durante en línea. Gracias porque... Tú nos amas, Señor, a pesar de todas las circunstancias. Te damos gracias también por las ofrendas y todo lo que has, uh, uh, por medio de ti hemos recibido, Señor. Y te damos gracias por todas las bendiciones que nos has dado durante este tiempo. También, Señor, te pedimos que uh, nos bendigas camino a nuestro hogar, a donde vayamos por el resto de la semana y que estés con nosotros. Nos despedimos de este lugar, pero no de tu presencia, Señor. Te damos gracias por todo y te pedimos todo en el bendito nombre de Cristo Jesús. Amén.